certainly one of the most controversial topics we could discuss in regard to what the New Testament says about women has to do with women and ministry roles. On the one end of the spectrum, you have whole Christian traditions that say women cannot be priests, women should not be ordained ministers. Uh, these roles are actually forbidden in the New Testament. On the other end of the spectrum, you have more charismatic traditions that say wh whoever's got the gifts and whoever's got the Holy Spirit should be able to express their gifts in the body of Christ, and uh, that's not a gender thing. So what's the truth about this? What should we think? Well, let's deal with the two so-called problem passages that have often been used by both Protestants and Catholics and the Orthodox to rule women out of ministry. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2. The first thing to be said about both of those passages is they are correcting problems. Let me say that again. They are correcting problems. In 1 Corinthians, the problem is you have women more specifically wives, who are asking questions in the worship service and disrupting the worship service. Paul's not happy with that. He says to these women, if you've got any questions, ask your man at home. Don't be turning worship into a Q&A session. It's a correction of a specific problem. It's not a banning of women in, from speaking in worship in general or a command that they should always be silent in worship. Look at 1 Corinthians 11, only three chapters before. What Paul said about this subject is, it's fine for women to pray and prophesy in the worship service as long as they do it in a decent and orderly fashion. He wanted them to be having their hair covered uh, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is only God's glory should be seen in worship. And as Paul says, a woman's hair is her glory, so only God's glory should be seen, cover the woman's hair, and then she can pray and prophesy in worship. No problems with women speaking in worship leading in worship, offering inspired speech in worship, leading the prayer in worship, not a problem, but it needs to be done decently and in order, for God is a God of order, says Paul, and not a God of chaos. First Timothy 2, a little bit different problem. You have high-status women that he's trying to correct. Now, what we know about high-status women in the Greco-Roman world is they were more likely to be educated than other kind of women. And they were more likely to assume that they could immediately assume important roles in whatever religion they participated in. After all, in the temple of Artemis, or in the temple of Aphrodite, or this goddess, or that goddess, they could be priestesses. They could be the Vestal Virgins in Rome. So when a Gentile woman comes into the church and she's educated and she's had important even teaching religious roles in other religions, the natural assumption is, well, I should be able to do this in Christianity as well. Paul is saying, not so fast. You need to learn before you teach. You need to listen and learn before you teach. So what Paul says is, in that context, First of all, he says, I am not now permitting women to teach or usurp authority over the, those who are all the, already the male teachers in Ephesus. What I want them to do instead is to listen and to learn. Now, that verb, I am not now permitting, doesn't ever in any Greek text that I know of mean I would never permit, I don't permit. He's correcting a problem. He's correcting a problem of eager beavers who want to jump in and do some teaching and even usurp the roles of those who are already the authorized teachers. Paul is saying, no way, Jose, we're not going to do this. We're going to do this orderly in good fashion. If you back up to the beginning of that passage, Paul is an equal opportunity critiquer of men. He says, I want men to lift up holy hands without grumbling. No grumbling, please, men. No bling, please, women. And please don't interrupt the already authorized teachers. It's correcting problems, not ruling out women from being ministers of various kinds. When we look at the actual examples of women in ministry, here are some of the surprising things that we discover. In the book of Acts, we have women who are prophetesses, the daughters of, of Philip. We have women who are teachers. Priscilla teaches a famous male Christian teacher named Apollos in Acts 18. We have women who take on the role of deaconess. Uh, Phoebe is mentioned in Romans 16, but we also have Tabitha in the book of Acts. We have women apostles. Yes, you heard me right, women apostles. Romans 16 says that Andronicus and Junia were noteworthy among the apostles. That is, they were notable apostles. 
the criteria for being an apostle was having seen the risen Lord and commissioned by him to serve him in various ministry tasks. In Philippians 4, Paul corrects two women, Euodia and Syntyche, who are his quote-unquote co-workers, which means co-workers in ministry because they're causing a kerfuffle in Philippi, and he wants to put a stop to it. He would not be correcting a mere domestic dispute unless it was disrupting the house church worship, and he calls them co-workers. So there's plenty of evidence that the basis for ministry roles is not gender in the New Testament. The basis for ministry roles is who is called, who is gifted by the Holy Spirit, and who is given opportunity and training to serve in some kind of task of ministry. And it could be in a ministry couple, like Andronicus and Junia, or Priscilla and Aquila. It could be as a single woman, like Phoebe, who Paul says was his patroness and looked after him when he stayed in Corinth, in the town of Kinkria, which is uh, the, one of the port cities of Corinth. In other words, we have all the evidence we could possibly need to show that in the new covenant, in the new order, with the coming of the kingdom, in the eschatological reality of the new thing called Christianity, women and men could indeed serve a variety of roles both in the family and in ministry, or as Paul puts it in Galatians 3.28. For in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, no male and female, for all are one in Christ. This has been called the Magna Carta of human freedom. And those that it most set free in so many ways were women. Women who could serve both in the family and in the family of faith.